Well, this evening, I want to do a study, uh, those of us who are married, it'll be a blessing for us. And those of you guys who are waiting for that special someone, I want to give you guys four biblical truths this evening. A little background about myself. Um, you know, for many times, many years, I felt unqualified to teach a marriage study. I made a lot of mistakes when it comes to marriage. And my wife is here this evening, and, and we don't have that, uh, you know, we're not high school sweethearts per se. My wife and I met in the world. I had already been uh, married before. I got divorced at a very young age. My life spiraled out of control. I got involved with drugs, and I couldn't uh, get sober to save my life. It was just, it was like a pattern of my life. In uh, 2004, I, uh, <clears throat> my wife now ended up getting pregnant. We weren't married at the time. You know, we come from a crazy background, both of us, promiscuous, um, and just a lot, a, lot, a lot of background. And um, she ended up getting pregnant, and I was spiraling out of control. My personal life was just out, out of control. And uh, when she told me she was pregnant, I, I told her, you know what, I think uh, you should have an abortion. I already had a daughter from previous that I was trying to raise. I got 50% custody of, but still, it just, I, I thought to myself, how am I going to take care of another child now? struggling with, with the one I have now. And my life's just out of control. And um, interestingly enough, I had tried going to church. I had tried, but I wasn't committed. One foot in, one foot out. And it's something that for of us to take root. You know, we can easily come here and, 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 and do our civic duty per se. Just show up for the Sunday thing, but really have no conviction. Really not be committed. And so I told her, hey, you know, I called the place. Why don't you go in and have an abortion? A few days later, she told me, you know what? I talked to my mom, and I decided to keep the baby. And I know this doesn't sound appropriate, obviously. And I said, oh, man, I was kind of disappointed. And just to give you a picture of where my mind was. And I told her, have you ever been to church? My wife didn't grow up Christian. She didn't grow up. She, you know, they knew of the Lord, but, you know, she, hadn't, she can't say she grew up going to church. I said, would you like to go? And she said, well, I'm not opposed to it. I remember that previous to this, I, uh, my old boss, we were out partying one Saturday evening. Sunday morning, he wakes me up. I spent the night at his house. He wakes me up and he says, get up, we're going to go to church. I thought to myself, who does that? Who parties all weekend, all Saturday, and then goes to church on Sunday? <laughs> surprisingly, enough, surprisingly enough, we were in Orange Crest. He lived in Riverside at the time. And he drives all the way to Diamond Bar and goes to, takes me to Calvary Chapel, Golden Springs. I go in there. We walk in Sunday morning. As soon as we walk in, have you ever been to Calvary Chapel? It's pretty big, the one, the one in Diamond Bar. You go to the right, there's a coffee shop. We walked in. I had all bad intentions. When we got to the coffee shop, I thought, oh, well, who do I know here? Hey, I think I know those girls there. Right? The wrong motive. Looking around. I heard the message that Sunday. I did not recommit my life to the Lord. But God was already working, right? It planted a seed in my heart. Fast forward now, 2004. I tell my girlfriend at the time, do you want to go to church? She said, yes. And where do we go? Calvary Chapel, Golden Springs. I began to go in December of 2004. Our son was born. In fact, next week, I think it's a week on the 10th. He's going to be 18 years old by the grace of God. And how foolish to think that at one time, you know, I contemplated him not being here. And that is truly the grace of God. I can't say I, 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 I changed overnight, began going. I did not serve at that time, but I was going to church 2004. 2005, that girlfriend I had, we ended up getting married. In 2006, we had another son. We each had a daughter from previous so in 2006, uh, our son Jacob was born. 2007, I would go on a trip that would change my, the course of the direction of my life. I'd go to Israel with Raul. There was 100 men that were on that trip. I happened to go on there, and I came back never the same. <clears throat> Since January of 2008, I've been serving faithfully uh, at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs. Uh, next year, we'll celebrate 18 years of marriage with my wife by the grace of God. <laughs> So I, want, I wanted to share, and I'm thankful, guys, for God's grace upon our lives and upon our marriage. You know, I don't know how long you guys have been married here, maybe some of you guys longer, 
Maybe you, some of you guys less. Maybe some of you are praying for that special someone. You know, don't give up. God hasn't forgotten about you. And his timing is perfect. But with that being said, I do want to share this. Aside from the gift of salvation that God, God has given me, the next greatest gift God has given me is my wife. And why I share this is because marriage is very important. Take note of this. Your relationship with your spouse is very important. And Satan wants nothing more than to destroy it. Satan doesn't want you married. Satan will, will, will pry and pull and do whatever he can to divide you guys. Because if he, if he divides the marriage, then guess what? It splinters the children. It's a trickle effect. It'll affect everyone in that household. And so easily, so cunning, he comes in and spreads division within our marriage. And as I was thinking about this study, I want to give you guys four biblical truths today regarding marriage and our walk with our, and, and, and walking worthy of our marriage. You know, who here who's married wouldn't want their marriage solidified in Christ? We'd be fools to say no. You know, we, we should desire a stronger marriage. We should desire a, 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 a marriage that's thriving. You don't want a marriage that's surviving. You want your marriage to thrive. Right? To be on fire for the Lord, but yet to be on fire for each other. That's what it's for. God created this. You know, a picture of marriage, when you see the Bible, it's a picture of marriage. From the beginning all the way to the end. In fact, the Lord's going to come back for his church. We go up the judgment seat, then after that, what happens? The marriage supper of the Lamb. Whether the ceremony is going to be longer in heaven or we come back in the second coming and have the feast here, the Bible doesn't tell us, but it's going to happen. But the Bible is a picture of marriage. And the world wants nothing more than to distort marriage. Look what they're doing. Look at their agenda. They come against it. So we're going to be in the book of Ephesians today. Ephesians chapter 4. I want to give you all four things. Simply, simple biblical truths. A background about the book of Ephesians. It was written by Paul. And it's what we call one of the prison epistles. Along with Colossians, which I love. Right, the preeminence of Christ it speaks about. Then you have Philippians, which uh, the theme of Philippians is joy, rejoicing in the Lord. And then you have Philemon. But in this letter, Paul outlines and teaches the Ephesians some of the deepest and greatest truths of God. I'm going to just sum it up for you guys. In the first three chapters, he outlines all the riches that are ours in Christ, teaching us what it means to be the church, the bride of Christ, and our standing position because of what he's done for us. Chapter 1, he speaks about the redemption that we have in Christ. Chapter 2, he speaks about he made us alive when we were dead in our trespasses. He's our, uh, Christ is our peace. He's our cornerstone. In chapter 3, he speaks about the mystery, right? The mystery revealed. And what is the mystery? The, dens the dispensation of the grace of God. Chapters 1 to 3. And then from chapter 3 and on, the last three chapters, Paul applies these truths in a very practical way outlining the walk of the believer in light who we are in Christ. The walk of the believer. That's what I'm going to speak about today. He talks about walk. And when, when, he, when he says walk, it's not just a physical position, but it's, that word walk means the manner of life. How we conduct ourselves as Christians. How we conduct ourselves in a marriage. You know, we're, not, we're no longer who we used to be. I, I love Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, where Paul says, I beseech you. Paul's saying, I beg you, I urge you, by the mercies of God, by what, because of what Christ has done for you and I. Right? He gave his only son. He says, because of what he has done for you, to, for you to present now your members, your body as a living sacrifice. Think of it. Because of what Christ has done for us, now we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, he says. And he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that what is that perfect and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're no longer who we used to be. But why is it that sometimes in the marriage we tend to go back to those old things, those old habits, and it causes grief? You, you know, it's interesting. We can fool people, but you can't fool your spouse. Your spouse is with you 24-7. And as I came to the Lord, I, I know I, I, I summarized my testimony there, but it, the first few years was really rough. 
You see, I had one foot in, one foot out. Our church is very big. You could come in, sit on a Sunday, Wednesday, nobody would know it. Come in before the last song is over, go out, and keep living your life. And see, my view of Christianity was like, I, I could go to church, but if I feel like having one or two, I can have it. No, I can't. You see, then you start compromising. And what happened, it started getting strife in my marriage. My wife was like, hey, I thought you were a Christian. I thought we were going to church. And you continue to do those things. Coming back from a background of addiction, why would I want to dabble with those things again? And your spouse knows you. And sometimes your spouse begins to call you out on these things, right? And we don't like it. Think about that for a moment. And your spouse means well. They love you. They know that those things will bring hurt into the marriage. So why would we want to do them again? And Paul's saying, hey, you've been transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're no longer who we used to be. We've been saved by grace. I noted this. If we're struggling with who we used to be, then let me tell you, you're going to struggle in marriage. That's what I mean. Your spouses don't want the old you. They desire a lifelong with the new you, the new creation that you are in Christ. The Bible says that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are new creations in Christ. If so, then why do we continue to do those things that we used to do before? I struggled in my marriage, guys. One foot in, one foot out. So much so that before I went on that trip to Israel, my wife found a large quantity of drugs in my pocket. And, you know, I, I remember looking at her face, and it wasn't a, a face of disgust, but she was truly disappointed. Like, man, this guy's never going to get it. And by the grace of God, I went on that trip. And one of my prayers of that trip was, Lord, I don't want to come back the same. Lord, change me. And in that trip, I yielded my life to the Lord. So I want to share this with us. If we're struggling in our marriage, it's a time for us to examine ourselves. It's easy for us to examine our spouse and point out a list of what's wrong with them. Listen, before you can fix them, you need to fix yourself. Work on your relationship with the Lord. That word walk comes from the Greek word uh, <clears throat> peripateo, figuratively signifying the whole round of activities of the individual life. As I shared, it's our manner of life. How is your walk today? How is your walk? Just an examination. Are you walking worthy of your marriage? It's easy to say yes when you're holding her hand. But what about at work when no one's looking? Are you honoring your spouse? I, I noted this. Our personal spiritual, our personal spiritual climate or condition or condition can dictate the direction of our marriage. Our personal spiritual climate or condition can dictate the direction of our marriage. That word dictate means to lay down authoritatively, to set the course of our marriage. If we're spiritually off, then how can, and this is for us men, this is for you men here today. If you're spiritually off, how are you going to lead your wife? We're called to lead. And if we're not spiritually on point, then guess what? We're off. And then you wonder why she doesn't submit. Then you wonder why she's not following. And the man way to do it is to try to subject her into following you. I like to say, if you're not submitted to Christ, then it's hard for somebody to submit to you. We need to be submitted to Christ. So I want to give us four things this evening. Very simple truths as, as Paul outlines this to walk. And the first one is, is, if, is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Anytime we see that word, therefore, it's always in a context because of what he said previously. So in chapter uh, 3 at the end, he talks about Christ dwelling in our hearts, that we're rooted, that we're grounded in love. And because of this, Paul goes on to say that we are to what? Walk in unity. And he goes on to say, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. He says, with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit 
in the bond of peace. And he says, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. What's that calling? Worthy of the calling? We've been called to be children of God by faith. Chuck says, so walk worthy of your calling as a saint, as a child of God, as an heir of God. So what does that mean? That as children of God, our access needs to be on point with the Lord. We need to be on point. I like to say, if your relationship is on point with the Lord, then guess what? Everything else will fall into place. But if you're off, you, you ever notice when you're off spiritually, you're striving with relationships, even your friends? It's like we're not seeing eye to eye. There's a strife in there. There's a strife in marriage. If one of us is maybe more involved than the other one, sometimes we don't see eye to eye because the spiritual condition is off. And here he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which, which you, with which you were called. Verse 2, he says, with all lowliness. That word lowliness means with humility. That's a key for us in marriage. And gentleness. Gentleness is the quality of being kind, tender, or mild-mannered. You know, for us men, we need gentleness in our relationships, right? We tend to be quick. We tend to be short. Not literally, but, <laughs> but we tend to be short with our spouses. Sometimes we have a bad day at work, and we come and take it out of the wife. It says, with long suffering, that's patience and enduring, bearing one another in love. Our manner of life should be in humility. Humility is the opposite of pride. You know, it's interesting. I, I had a chance to, uh, at church we do many things, and, and many times we're called to give biblical direction. We don't call it biblical counseling because we're not professional counselors, but we will give you biblical instruction from the Word of God. And I remember they said, hey, Minor, we needed you to talk to this a couple. And sometimes in church, you may know the people. Some people are older than you. Some people are younger. Some people have been married for a long time. And I knew this particular couple. They've been married for a long time, older than myself. Remember, I walked into the room. There was a husband and wife. And before I can utter a word, as I walked in to give them biblical direction, before I could even open my Bible, he said to me, I've been a Christian for 30 years. There's nothing you can tell me. And he goes on to give me a list. Before I could say a word, he, he, he told me everything he knew. And I said, you know what? If you've been a Christian for 30 years, I want to ask you one question. He's like, why? Why are we here? If you've been a Christian 32 years walking with the Lord and you know everything in the Bible, then why am I here in this room with you and your wife? He was boiling. He was upset. And it was pride. He had so much pride in his heart already that he wasn't willing to hear. No matter what I told him that day, he, 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 was, he was already shut down before he even got into that room. He ended up storming out of that room, going back on drugs immediately. Going, or, and you know what? To, to think about it, he's probably already doing drugs. And this was the effect of it. And after that, his life spiraled out of control. They ended up getting divorced. At the end... He ended up passing away, but right before he passed away, he gave his life back to the Lord. You know, it's interesting. You can continue to live in pride if you want, but you have two choices. You can either humble yourself before the Lord, or he's going to humble you. But it's going to happen. But a manner of life should be in humility. Humility is the opposite of pride. You want to show humility in your marriage. and your marriage. Serve your spouse and serve each other. <coughs> Proverbs 11, 7 says, When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. Are we serving our spouses the way we should? Walking in unity is walking in humility. And he talks about gentleness. I want to give you guys just some simple things. Uh, to, to be gentle and, and gentleness is to, to listen. You know, I have a problem with this one. As you can see, I like to talk. <laughs> And it's easy for me to interject. I talk to so many people on a daily basis, and many times I need to come home. And my wife doesn't need a Bible teacher. She's not looking for a biblical direction. You know what she needs? Her husband. And right away, you know, you want to give a three-point sermon. I, I heard uh, for the uh, men's conference, 
uh, Al Pittman said something great. He goes, you know what? I was talking with my wife, and, and right away after my wife told me what she wanted to let me know, I wanted to give her a sermon. I wanted to start with the joke, the three points, and a conclusion. <laughs> and many times they don't want that. They want their husband. They just want you to listen. My wife said that to me the other day. She said, man, babe, I appreciate you listening to me. It's just a simple listening, being gentle, communicating with each other. This is key, communicating with each other. Long-suffering is to be patient. Are you patient with your spouse? Women, are you, are, are you patient with your husbands? And husbands, are you patient with your wives? And for those of you who are single, hey, write these things down because they're going to be useful. You're going to need these things. When you do find that special someone, this is what you should be leaving out. And patience is a virtue. Patience is hard. You know, it's not being patient. It's, it's easy for us to be patient one day. What about, a, what about an ongoing thing? Patience is not something that grows out of us. Patience is something we put on every day. It says bearing one another. That means lifting each other up. Edifying one another. When's the last time you complimented your spouse? Complimenting each other. Listen to this. If you don't compliment your spouse, there's somebody at work that will. If you're not complimenting your spouse, the devil's so cunning that he has somebody, a her or a him, ready to compliment them. And if we're not girded spiritually, we may fall. Look at the story of David and Bathsheba. There was David on his idle time. He comes out. Do you think he thought to himself, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to commit adultery, I'm going to commit murder? Never. All he did was come out. That's about the time the men were at war. He comes out, he happens to look, and there's a girl there bathing. It caught his attention. You know, when temptation comes, and, 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 and why I share this with us is when I say somebody will compliment your spouse, because we're not, we're not exempt from temptation as Christians. Many times you want to think that, but no, temptation does come. The choice you have is, are you going to give in to temptation, or are you going to run from temptation? And so Bathsheba is there bathing, David sees her, and then he looked at her. And then he said, it, it, the Bible says that he inquired of her. You see, now he's meditating in his mind. Oh, she's beautiful. Oh, who is that girl? And then it says when he inquired of her, I love this portion of scripture. It says, and someone said, isn't that the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Isn't that beautiful? Think about it. He was tempted. We all will be tempted. But that was the way of escape. Someone said, isn't that the wife of Uriah? For us who are married here today, and even if you're not, if you're facing temptation, let, let me reiterate that to you. God will give you. He does give you a way of escape. It's up to you to take it, though. That's when we surrender our yield, surrender our lives and say, Lord, give me the wisdom. Lord, give me the strength. Lord, I'm faced with this decision. Help me. Because when we don't, what happens? The Bible says, by way, by means of a way of a harlot, a man is reduced to a what? A crust of bread. So fast. And then you look back and think, well, what happened? What do you mean, what happened? You didn't fall into it. You walked right into it. You ran to it. And God is giving us a way of escape. And that's for married people and also people who are unmarried. I believe even as unmarried people, they have even greater temptation. We need each other's affirmation. Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. There's a way where we can edify our spouse. There's a way where we can encourage our spouse instead of tearing them down. In today's culture, many marriages are living proof of the opposite. Husbands and wives are prideful and don't want to hear it. No gentleness toward each other. I was looking up stats on a divorce last night. I think they used to be at 50%, but the, the, the rate of marriage has gone down. People are not getting married as much. They'd rather just live with each other. And we're still at 40%. Think about it from this perspective. Half of this church here, God forbid, when you're looking at big numbers, is headed for divorce. That's a huge number. Why? 
Because people would rather say, hey, you know what, I don't want to deal with it. We're called to a different calling. Your spouse is your spouse for life. God gave you that spouse. It's up to you how you treat them. It's up to us what we do. Verse 3 says, endeavoring, make it a name, a goal, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You should make it a goal to bring peace in the home. You know, you know when there's a, a, a disagreement, it can happen. Disagreements happen. There's no perfect marriage in here. Remember serving in a... I was in church, and we, uh, we had just left the morning service. I went home, and my wife and I had a little disagreement about something. And I was headed to church to serve in the evening service. And I forgot exactly what it was, but we got into it, and I'm just like, well, you know, this and that. and We don't cuss in our home, but, you know, you can still be hurtful without saying a bad word. In fact, you can demean somebody for life without using a curse word. But we're having this disagreement, and I said, well, I'm out of here. i got to go to church while you go, and it just wasn't good. I leave. I jump on my car. I'm driving to church, and I'm upset inside. Inside, I'm still boiling, right? I'm like, ah, oh, man. And I don't feel right. I said, how am I going to go serve the people when I've had this disagreement with my wife? I walk into church, park my car, walk in, and I felt this restlessness. I said, you know what? I can't. Before I got more, I made a U-turn. I walked back to my car. I got in my car and drove home. When I got there, my wife opened the door, and she probably thought, oh, man, round two, he's back. <laughs> she said, you're back? I said, I am. And she <laughs> looked at me like, what? I said, you know what? I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry. As I was driving, the Lord convicted me, and how can I serve the Lord? How can I serve the people when I can't serve you? Think about that for a moment. Not to say that, though, you know, but, but putting it in perspective. Make things right at home. You know, at, at that time, it was more important for me to be at home than to be in church. It's more important for me to help restore my marriage than to go help restore someone else. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. A cord of three stands is not quickly broken, it says. The cord of three stands represents God, the groom, and the bride. It represents the marriage. Braiding these three strands symbolizes the joining of one man, one woman, and God in our marriage. You see, when you don't have God in the marriage, then it's easy to split up and divide and go your own way. You, you know what? You go your way, I'll go my way. Just give me 50-50, she says, right? No. But it's easy to go each other's way, but we have God at the center of our marriage. He's holding us together. So the first thing we saw was to walk in unity. The second thing I want to look at is in Ephesians chapter 5. Just turn the page over there, and I want to look at verses 1 and 2. And Paul still maintains this thing. He says, walk in unity. Number two, walk in love. And because of this, he goes on to say, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The second thing, to safeguard your marriage. Walking in love, do you guys know what that means? It's to walk in forgiveness. This is important for us. We can't be imitators of Christ if we're not walking in forgiveness. Some of us have been hurt, but have we allowed the Lord to really heal us? Ruth Graham said, A happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. A great marriage is the result of two good forgivers. Notice that it's just not forgiving once, it's an ongoing thing. Forgiving your spouse and moving forward, and continued forgiveness. But you know what? Nowadays we have this thought, or this saying that we forgive, but we don't forget. We forgive, but we don't forget. And we constantly bring up the hurt. We constantly, well, do you remember? You said this, and you said that. And there we go back, spiraling out of control. I noted this, when we don't forgive, it starts to fester and turns into bitterness, then resentment, then frustration, 
and then it becomes to show up. Forgiveness. You know, I noted this. We should be, you and I should be the greatest forgivers because we ourselves have been forgiven of so much. The verse earlier this morning was Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his love towards us yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has forgiven you and me of so much. And some of us haven't found it in ourselves to forgive our spouse. We need to forgive. What about our parents? What about our loved ones? If I were to survey this room, we could all probably talk about hurt. Talk about pain. We've been hurt by someone. And you can choose to live with that hurt. And I'm not trying to make light of anyone's hurt here today. Or we can choose to forgive. You know, when we choose to forgive, it, it heals us. It heals us. We don't carry that hurt. We don't carry that burden anymore. And we're saying, Lord, I'm giving it to you. Forgiving. The third thing, and moving right along, is we need to walk in light. And he says it right there as well in, in Ephesians chapter 5, moving down to verse 8. It says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship. That means don't partake with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. So we saw that in a marriage we're to walk in unity, we are to walk in love, we're to walk in forgiveness. The third thing is we're to walk in light. And this is very important. Walking in light means there's nothing hidden in our lives. Nothing hidden in our lives. You know, one thing about light is light exposes everything. Light shines on you and it'll expose everything. And God's word is light and he exposes our hearts. He exposes our, li our, our lives. You know, there's nothing your spouse shouldn't know about you. You know, my wife, can, my wife has access to my cell phone. You guys could come and look through my cell phone if somebody were to ask. There's nothing hidden in here. There's nothing here that shouldn't be here. And that's the way we should be. I see so many people struggle with giving their spouses full uh, permission to use their phone or bank accounts or whatever it is. As there's nothing hidden in our lives. What are you holding back? Oh, well, it's because you know what, because of work, and this is my work phone. I've heard everything in biblical, in biblical instruction and direction when we're with married couples. Well, it's because, you know, brother, you know, that, that phone is for work, and it has passwords, and it has, well, stop. You're not a secret agent, bro. <laughs> you're not a secret agent. There's something that you're hiding that you don't want your spouse to know. No, no, I kid you not, there's not. Listen, we're only fooling ourselves. We're only fooling ourselves. There's nothing should be hidden in our lives. And I want to ask you a question. For those of us who are married, even if your spouse is not here, is there any area of your life where there's compromise today? You have to answer that audibly. You know, perhaps we're wandering thoughts when we're at work. Whatever it may be. Maybe we're not getting complimented enough at home. And yet we're giving in to the compliments from others at work. Or perhaps we're <clears throat> looking at things we're not supposed to. You know, it's interesting that adultery doesn't always have to be in a physical form. It could be in an emotional form as well. You could be connecting with somebody on social media every day. and You look forward more to that person than you do with your spouse. I've seen everything. I've, I've been serving part of leadership of the church for years. And let me tell you, one thing Satan loves to do is destroy marriages. Remember when I first got to church, there was a brother who would always encourage me. He was an usher. He said, brother, get to church, get to church. 
And I was still struggling right again. There's sometimes half sober, and I'm just like, who is this guy? But he would always encourage me. And he would tell my wife, kick him out of the house, send him to church on Thursdays, and send him to church on Fridays. And so when I finally gave, committed my life to the Lord, I was like, man, I want to inquire of that guy. Who, where is that guy? That guy was always encouraging me in the hallway. You see what happened? The enemy deceived him. And he was going to church, and yet his wife wasn't to par. And so he looked over to the other side of the church, and there was a sister in the church who was looking over at him. Somehow they said they heard from the Lord, they left their spouses, and they married each other. Let me tell you, that is a life of the pit of hell. God doesn't speak that way. God would never ask you to destroy your marriage for you to go be happy with someone else. That's not the way the Lord works. That's your flesh. And from, I, I share these things from a leadership position because in ministry I've seen many things. And you would think that that was the last time it happened. No, it continues to happen because people leave the gateway open. People leave the door open to their hearts, to their lives. The light's not coming, or, or they leave it open, and they allow the enemy to come in. But see, if you allow God's light to come in and, and, and expose that, expose the condition of the heart, then you can re make those realignments. You can say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I give it to you. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it takes your part to confess. It takes your part to say, you know what? I'm wrong. But you know what the enemy does? He puts that pride in there where we say, no, I'm not. And that pride will hurt you. We are to walk in, uh, we are to walk in light. We cannot allow sin to permeate in our lives. The Bible says that a little leaven leavens a whole lump. What does leaven do? It's a preservative. And there it goes, and, and it's used for bread. And so if we allow a little bit of sin in your life, it's going to ravage you. I would pray today that if any one of us who are married are dabbling, it would end today. It would end today. I've seen many of my friends suffer in ministry, in their marriages, and Satan come and ravage them because they did not deal with sin. And I share this openly with you because we don't want to be that statistic. Everyone hurts. It's so sad when you find out there's infidelity in the marriage. Secret sin, it will destroy your marriage, it will destroy your character, it will destroy your children, it will destroy you. It will destroy the ministry. Martin Luther says, there is no estate to which Satan is more opposed as to marriage. The unity. I pray all of us would be walking in the light today. 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin." Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Listen, you are light. You can't hide. The fourth thing we saw, we need to walk in unity, to walk in love, to walk in light. And the fourth thing we are to do in our marriage, and even as us, uh, those who are single here today, is to walk in wisdom. Notice that, a continuous thing. And there it says in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are what? Evil. That word circumspectly means for us to walk carefully, to be diligent, to be mature. Be careful where you go. Be careful what you're doing. These aren't the times to be playing around. When you're walking in wisdom, you're walking circumspectly. You're safeguarding your marriage. You know, no matter where I go, I represent, number one, the Lord. People see me here, but people see me in church. The thing I, first thing I represent anywhere I'm at is the Lord. I always tell people, you're representing something. You're either representing the Lord or misrepresenting the Lord. And enough people are doing that already. We're to represent Christ everywhere we go, whether at work, where we eat. People listen to your conversation. I'm always perplexed when I, I, I go to a dealer or I'm, I'm at an establishment, a restaurant, and people are cussing up a storm, 
And then they see you pray there. Oh, you go to church? Yeah, I go to church. I go to Calvary Chapel of the Springs. Oh, I go to church too. They were just spewing a bunch of profanity. We blow our witness. And I share that because we don't want to be like that. I'm not trying to be overcritical or judgmental. But how are we displaying our, our testimony out there? Number one, we represent the Lord. Number two, being involved in ministry, whether I like it or not, I'm a representation of the ministry. They, oh, I've seen you, brother, over there. Right? They know. People know. And the third thing, and most important, you know what I represent? My wife. Oh, man, that brother's married. Man, I see him talking to that girl all the time. Hey, aren't you married? Hey, what are you doing? We're a representation of our spouse. Are we walking in wisdom? Are you protecting yourself from a, from a leadership aspect? No women ever ride in my car. I have this thing. I serve in ministry. Why would another woman be riding in my car? Listen, I have many friends. God bless their heart, but they don't belong in my car at all. If my wife's not there, no women rides in my car. That's a, something I've, I've placed in my life to protect myself, to protect my marriage. Why would I want to put myself in that predicament for somebody to say, hey, I saw Brother Minor over there. Man, he had a nice looking gallon there and it wasn't his wife. But sometimes we put ourselves in these positions. Let's face it, we make some dumb choices. Are we walking circumspectly? Are we being wise? You have a choice. Safeguard your marriage. And the same thing for spouses, wives. You're not exempt. You know, I, I think I was sharing with my wife the other day. I said, it's not us. Many times we, we like to blame our spouse, but we forget that there's an element. It's the enemy. Don't blame your spouse. It's the devil. He'll come in. He'll try to come in and deceive her. What did he do in the Garden of Eden? He went after Eve. And what did the Lord say? Adam, where were you? You know, men, the responsibility is for us. We're the leads. We're the heads of our homes. And so, so walking in wisdom, circumspectly, I, I, I noted this, know your boundaries. This is very practical. Know your boundaries as a man. Know your boundaries as a wife. Do you always seem to be talking to that gentleman? First of all, your hands should never be on, on, on someone else. Well, he had some here. And listen, keep your hands to yourself. Know your boundaries. Know your boundaries. If you're misaligned, you know, I noted this, it's not too late to make it right. You know, perhaps you're dabbling in something you're not. It ends today. You don't want to continue to do this. When we're walking like fools, we're, sus we're susceptible or likely liable to be influenced or to be harmed by a particular thing. And, and I don't want none of us to fall prey to that it won't happen to me syndrome. Oh, brother, that won't happen to me, brother. Oh, I've been married 32 years. No, let me tell you, it'll happen to anyone. And it's sad when it does. Because you know what? The, the Lord's always speaking, and many times he gives us warnings. But yet we're too proudful to take them. Who here tonight wouldn't want to safeguard their marriage? You see, we're to walk in unity in humility, in gentleness, with long-suffering, in the spirit of unity. We're to walk in love. That means to walk in forgiveness. We're to walk in light. That means no sin in our lives. And we're to walk in wisdom, circumspectly safeguarding our walk and our marriage. You know, it's interesting, as we're moving through the book of Ephesians chapter 4, then you go into 5, those things. Then it ends like this. Look, at chapter 5, it says, Walk in wisdom in verse 21. After, when you're walking in unity, when you're walking in love, when you're walking in wisdom, right? Then verse 21 says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And then it goes on to say, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But I want to end there with verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. You see, right, many times it's hard to submit to your husband or to your wife in the fear of the Lord when you're not walking in unity, when you're not walking in love, when you're not walking in light, and when you're not walking in wisdom. But if you are, guess what? And you're submitted to the Lord, and it's going to make it easier to submit to each other in the fear of the Lord.
John Benton said, the Christian married couple can be a powerful weapon in the hands of Jesus. And that should be all of us. We should, we should aim to have a thriving marriage, a spiritual marriage, so that the Lord can use our lives. I want to pray.